I failed at school. I only got two O levels. One was maths, the other one wasn't. And uh, but I knew I was good at maths. So it was crazy. It was there was lots of reasons for that. But I left school and got a job with the Avalon Aircraft Corporation, and I just took off. Well, they made aircraft, you see. No, I really did. As soon as I was in the workplace, I had no trouble. Only in education did I have trouble. And I just went like a rocket. So I was going to be a, an industrial accountant. But I thought, for the rest of my life? Ooh. And so the chance came up. Well, I had to go into the forces for national service. But I signed on. And if you sign on, you get twice the money. It's all beer money in those days. When did that age? And you can dictate your career and the path. So I elected for a career or a path that would take me, most certainly, abroad. So they sent me to Wales. <laughs> the Forces was my university. And for three years, I just learned and enjoyed every minute and worked hard as well. I was successful, so it was all great. But I knew I'd always wanted to be a comedian and what I was going to do when I came out was be a bottle and red coat, and that happened. And I had three great years, including a winter as well, and that was great. And that set me up to be a comic, and I left them, and uh, 12 years of a stand-up comic. Some clubs could be very tough, but mostly they were tough because they were too lively. <clears throat> And you had to settle them down and control them. But generally, they were okay. And as I say, if you weren't good at it, you didn't do it for long. And you learned how to handle just about any audience. So it was great. I used to have about eight or nine nights off a year. And sometimes do two or three clubs a night, you know. So it was very lucrative. I used to tour in my car with about six mohair suits. <clears throat> and, uh, oh, it's just, it's just a great time. But it's a young man's game. And I thought, I can't go around the clubs forever, I won't do that. Um, so I, I got the opportunity to go in children's television. And I tried it and loved the integrity of the whole thing. And suddenly realised, now there's something more creative perhaps going that way. A radio producer in Manchester heard they were looking for people for children's television and suggested me, thinking it would be Crackerjack and I would be ideal for it. And that's what I thought when I went for the interview. So I rushed in and I knew I got this, this job within two or three minutes. And the guy said, oh, you're gonna be wonderful on Play School. Sorry, Play, what's Play School? It's on 11 o'clock in the morning on BBC Two for under fives. And I'm off the door, I'm away, I'm a comedian, you know. <clears throat> and he came and grabbed me and he said, come back. He said, no, have a go. And so I went to an audition, because you have to do an audition, and all these actors, Humpty and I, Humpty and myself, and they were, I thought, what is this all about? So I went in and we did, sort of winged it. And, and this is what happens. You always get the job you don't want. And immediately I got this job. But once I'd done it for a couple of weeks, I loved the integrity. And it is a program for under five. So you have to block out all other audiences and think it's a program for under five. So that's what I did. So I stayed for 16 years. <laughs> But it was the start. I learned television. So I wrote all my scripts knowing what you could do with television. Um, knowing all the intricacies, all the kinds of things, three-pass uh, systems where you can talk to yourself, where you can be yourself, play yourself in sketches and things like that. All that I learned while I was with children's television. I was a jobbing writer and a jobbing writer would get £35 a minute. The trouble was, even if you put a four-minute script in for a Les Dawson or Mike Yarwood, it would get whittled down to two and a half, and they'd probably pay you two and a bit, and you couldn't earn a hundred pounds in a week. And there were lots of jobbing writers. The Monty Python people were jobbing writers then. Monty Python hadn't started yet. So we're all scrambling for very little. And suddenly somebody said, would you write for Playaway? And I said, yeah. And they said, how much should, should we pay you? I said, well... Pay me £30 a minute, because the adults pay 35 OK, first week, 16 minutes. <laughs> and suddenly I thought, hello, <laughs> I've struck gold. And that's what I did. And I wrote most of the comedy and loved it. And I had a great time. And, um, you see, I knew where other writers got their ideas from, like Ronnie Barker. All the ideas he, he, he used for his sketches, the mispronunciation or whatever, all those things. 
had come from other ideas from books and things like that, which I knew about. So I did all kinds of different versions of them myself, but for a smaller audience. We found, actually, that our adult audience was about 60%, and that was because uh, the humour was clean. It wasn't adult, but it was pretty funny. I mean, children's television for a good number of years, and I did a couple of comedy series which were very good, but they were also very expensive. There was all costume, a bit like uh, Crazy Histories or whatever horrible histories they have now, very similar to that, uh, but earlier. And uh, I, there wasn't a mileage in that because it was too costly. So they said, if you had your own series, what would you do? I said, I'd do a program on maths because it had been my hobby since I left school. I knew I was good at maths, and I knew I should have been done better in education. So it was there, and I realized that what I wanted to do was write factual information. And when I wrote Think of a Number, it all came out, and suddenly, the world is your oyster. You can talk about absolutely anything, and the mathematical aspect of it, or the scientific aspect of it. So 20 series later, I wrote them all and presented them all, uh, I was a totally different person. But that didn't start. I didn't write the first script till I was 39. So the whole career started from then, if you like. So it's amazing what you can do. And since then, I mean, I've just never been out of work. When I started writing, after a few shows, we started getting letters, I'm going to be a scientist because of you. And they showed them to me. And the hair stood up on the back of my neck. And I thought, I've got pressure here. And so by the second series, there were lots of letters coming in. And eventually, they didn't show me anymore. I got no more fan mail. Because, because the pressure was too great. Because I had to write new programmes. But as long as I was in my own cocoon writing my programmes, you know, I used to write them. I used to go to the pub until about quarter past 11. Just, just half past 10 to quarter past 11, just a couple of times. And write till about three or four in the morning. It's the only time I could write when I wasn't troubled by anybody. Zoe was in the next room, and she used to be sometimes awake by me on the typewriter, which she said she found fine, you know. Um, but but I had to write all those scripts, and, and as I say, the pressure was great, but it, it, it was so fulfilling. It was so enjoyable. Um, and the crew I had around me were so good and helped so tremendously well. So we worked as a great team. With think of a number, think again, um, think backwards, um, and uh, do, um, Johnny Ball reveal, reveals all. Good heavens, it's so long ago, I'm forgetting the title. But but they were so enjoyable, you know, a 20, 20 series of factual information programs I wrote. And I enjoyed them. And then we found out that the audiences were always about 60% adults. You see, and especially engineers used to write, retired engineers used to write and say, oh, that was wonderful. Nobody's ever mentioned that till. Did you know this? And suddenly I had more ammunition for the next shows. And it was just tremendous. So when I stopped doing them, and I had sort of almost run that out, you know, I thought, what am I going to do in television next? It didn't matter because the corporate world beat a path to my door. I worked for National Grid for six years. Uh, explaining how the grid works to the general public. I wrote their brochures explaining it. All those things started to happen because of my, my doing those shows, and it was just a wonderful start. I don't do jokes as such anymore. I, do, I really don't do them anymore. And if, if they are, they're very old jokes, and they've probably heard them. I don't do jokes. But I can make very serious information entertaining. Um, and, and that's what I do, and show all kinds of ways of making it entertaining and relating to that. And it's basically the way I did my programmes. And that works when I did it that way. So it doesn't matter what subject I'm talking about now to a after dinner, or, or a, to a, a conference audience, um, I can get some vitality into it, some excitement into it, some positive attitude into it, definitely some confidence growing, a confidence growing attitude into it, you know, that, that, that uh, people can go further than they think, can achieve more than they think. And that's what I add. I, I think I'm more motivational than I ever was now. And I'm, I'm chuffed that I, I stand behind that. And it seems to work and the audiences seem to uh, latch onto it.
I once did, a, a, not so long ago, I did a speech for um, a major, a, a major building company, one of the biggest. And they asked me in first. I was then hooked on, because I had a lot to say about climate change and global warming. What I said in the 90s has not changed iota, you know. If you look back at what I said, I haven't changed one word of what I said then to what I say now. I was absolutely right then. Lots of people thought I was going off on all kinds of attacks. I wasn't saying there was no such thing as climate change. I was trying to evaluate what are we talking about, really. And a lot of it is scientifically unsound, and that's what I was saying. It went very well, my talk with that, that keynote speech for that conference. And I talked to him on the Thursday. I think they did Monday to Wednesday. And I talked to him on the Thursday. I said, how did it go? He said, I'll tell you, not one speaker in the conference did not mention your opening. Not one. Everyone mentioned something you said and triggered something. Many of them are agreeing, some of them perhaps not. That's not the issue. I stimulated so much more thought, if you like, outside the box. And that's the important thing. You've got to make it flexible. It's no good a company thinking internally, thinking inwardly, and, and it's stifling. You've got to broaden it out.